everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luca. I'll be presenting some interesting content. I hope you find it interesting about pull requests. First of all, some disclaimers. Uh, I'd like to thank Pi Bay for inviting me to, to talk here. It's my first international talk, so I hope it goes well. Uh, this is going to be a talk mostly about soft skills, as you can imagine. Uh, we've been through some pretty hard skill talks, some pretty deep stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, some stuff that we usually don't discuss much. Uh, I'm going to assume some general knowledge here. Uh, it's not that if you don't know anything about pull requests, you're not going to understand. But uh, there might be some terms that uh, you, you would like to be familiar with in order to better understand. And also, I uh, might need to talk a little bit fast because of the time constraints. So let's get going. This is a pretty redundant slide uh, because I had to, to add the, the Pi Bay cover slide. But then again, I decided to keep it just so next time you look at the door that says pull, you remember this talk. It's a pull request. <laughs> so let's go. So first of all, who am I? I am a, I'm a full stack developer at Vinta. We are a software development company in Brazil. Company in Brazil. Uh, we developed uh, several projects, uh, mostly for American customers. We've got some customers here in California, some customers in New York. One of our projects is, uh, is, is actually the project that I work on. It's called Plus Plus, um, and uh, it's based here in California. I've got a master's in computer science, and uh, currently I work with Django and React at Vinta. Uh, a little bit of the basics. So, uh, code review and management, uh, pull requests in general is something that uh, people know, most people have heard about it, but uh, it, I think it's safe to say that it could be done better. Uh, people uh, with some tips, some, some simple, simple things they can do take, can take you a long way in the code management and review process. So first of all, let's ask, why should we review code? Uh, Actually, uh, a survey made by Codacy asked this question, among many others, to uh, 682 82 developers. And amongst the questions, there was a question regarding uh, what do they spend most of their time on. And you can see in this graph that uh, developers spend, on average, 51% of their time developing new features, 4% of the time developing, uh, doing other stuff, and 45% of their time uh, dealing with technical debt or bug fixing. So if you stop to think about it, that's almost half of the productive time of a developer uh, dealing with technical debt and bug fixing. And that could be uh, decreased a lot uh, in case the, with, with some, some, some help, some, some tips in the code review and management process, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, another question that was asked to these developers was, what change in your development process had the biggest impact to code quality? So, of course, there were some answers regarding tools and testing and management, but the, the one that stood up the most was code reviews. So developers think that code reviews are really important for the, their, their code quality. They were also asked if they use it to review code before or after deploying the code. So a small percentage use it to deploy it after, uh, or use it to review it after deployment. Uh, the, the most part used to review before deploying. Uh, a, a considerable amount uh, reviews code both before and after deploying the code, the code to production, and a small amount doesn't review code at all. And those guys are probably the ones responsible for this. I don't know if you were aware of this bug with the iOS calculator. They probably didn't test it much, didn't review the code. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, this study came to a shocking conclusion. What they found out is that doing code reviews before deployment is more beneficial than not reviewing code at all. So yeah, <laughs> who would guess, right? Uh, also, they've concluded that surprisingly doing code reviews both before and after the deployment performs less well than just doing it before. It performed kind of the same as doing just after. And that's basically because, according to their conclusions, uh, when you know that something is going to be reviewed again after the deployment, you don't pay as much at, uh, attention when you're reviewing it before deploying because you know sometime in, in the future you're going to look at it again. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the most common errors regarding code management and review. Uh, there are people that usually think uh, code review is a chore, I don't want to do it, it's, it's so boring, I got better stuff to do. But you got to remember that when you're reviewing code, you're actually learning. You're learning new features of the language, you're learning new ways of uh, 
uh, solve problems, you are learning a lot of stuff, and you're getting, you're getting paid to learn. Your employer is paying for you to review that code, and you're learning in that time. Uh, some people just say that they don't review code at all, and we've just seen what happens when you do that, right? Calculator. And uh, I'll skip code review due to the deadline. It's a very common phrase to hear because code review is often uh, treated as a, a second class. Uh, uh, it's not as important. But that's, that's a pretty, uh, pretty bad line of thought because, you, OK, you might deliver that feature one or two days sooner to the, for the customer, but you might have a bug that passed because you didn't review. That's going to cost you five days to, to fix it. Uh, now a little bit about best practices with pull requests. Um, the first one is I really recommend that you guys, if, if you want a repository, you work in a repository, uh, you create pull request templates. Because we are lazy, so we don't stop to look at documentations, at guidelines in general, to see how we should create a pull request, what should be included in a pull request. And our memory is error prone, so we can't rely on just remembering things that we need to include in the pull request. So a pull request is basically a template that's going to have everything that a person that's creating that pull request should feel like. Did you like a checkbox for did you write tests? Did you update the documentation? Did you run a coverage or something like that? Uh, tests that a person should uh, steps that a person should go through. Uh, to do it on GitHub, you just create a file called pull, pull request template .mark .md, markdown anywhere uh, actually in the root of your project. Uh, for GitLab, you create an MD file with any name inside GitLab slash merge request template. And Bitbucket, there's an issue open for it for about a year and a half, and they haven't figured it out yet. Uh, another thing regarding repository configuration, you can add status check. I think somebody mentioned status checks in order to talk uh, in, here at PyBay. Uh, uh, currently, GitLab doesn't support it. There's also an issue open for it for about a year and a half. Uh, the other two main repositories, Bitbucket and GitHub, do. Uh, so a status checks, in case you don't know, it's like uh, when you have uh, a CI, a continuous integration server, that's going to run your code and check if the tests are passing, just in case you don't uh, end up merging code that has broken, broken stuff in it. You can also add guideline files. For example, uh, on GitHub, you can add a file called contributing.md that tells people how they should contribute to your repository, which rules you should, they should follow. Even though I just mentioned that people are lazy, don't read the rules, but you shouldn't add this file anyway. Uh, you can also improve, uh, enforce approval and merge rules. Uh, on GitHub, you can, you can add a, a file called code owners. On GitLab, there's an open issue. In Bitbucket, there's something similar, but not so complete. These merge rules, they enforce that uh, pull requests made for specific areas of the code or for specific languages, for, for example, JavaScript or Python, uh, they have to be approved by a, spe by a, a specific reviewer before being merged. Uh, GitFlow is another awesome practice for dealing with code. Uh, GitFlow is an architecture, and, uh, and it ensures that your branches are always up to date. So uh, as you can have a general idea, if you don't know GitFlow from this image, uh, you have a, a, a main branch, a master branch, from which all of your feature branches will derive. So you make sure that everything that you're, development, you're developing is always um, extracting the newest, most updated code, so you don't end up having conflicts because you're pulling from old code. Uh, GitFlow also suggests that you create a separate branch for each feature. So uh, that's important because sometimes you're doing a feature and you somebody says, oh, 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 there's this button here. It's red. It should be blue. Can you fix that as well? And you say, OK, I'm, I'm already doing something around that. I'm just going to include in this pull request. But the problem is the feature that you're working on before, in case it doesn't get approved, this small change in the button is not going to get delivered as well. It's going to be on hold until the previous feature is approved. So create a separate branch for each feature. Remember that branches are cheap, and they bring great flexibility. Creating separate branches is not going to take uh, space on your computer, but it's going to help you a lot organizing your, your code. Uh, another important tip is about pull request sizes. So if you look at this picture, this is a pull request with 71 changed files. So whoever is going to have to review that is going to have to read through 71 files. So ain't nobody got time for that, right? <laughs> uh, so if you define well your issues, you, can, you usually generate small PRs. You, you generate changes that don't touch uh, that many files. So that's a good practice as well. Remember to always break down your issues very well. Uh, 
if you have a PR that's too big, the review quality and the time, uh, the time dedicated per section decreases. So if I have five files to review, I'll review them thoroughly. If I have, I don't know, 25 files, I'll start reading them diagonally because I don't have time to dedicate that much, atten that much attention. And if you have a shorter attention span, you end up, uh, you know, leaving more bugs. Uh, there's also a question that I'd like to, oh, sorry. There's also a question that I'd like to pose to you guys about uh, these two images. Which one of them would you be more likely to leave another empty dish? Like, do you think it'd be the dirty sink or the clean sink? Which one is more appealing to leave a dirty dish? <laughs> the dirty, yeah. Well, I, I'm glad that you guys think the same as I. I was worried that you were gonna give the, the, the other answer. Uh, so, um, in this, this is, uh, this is something I like to compare with reviewing pull requests. So sometimes you're developing and people ask you to review code and pull requests are kind of the same of a, as a dirty sink. So you, um, if you have like 10 or 12 pull requests to review, you just say, oh, there's another one, it's gonna go to the line, I'm gonna, some, I'm gonna review it sometime. But if you have like your queue empty, you, whenever a new pull request arrives, you'll be more inclined to just review it. And it's especially important that you don't uh, let me just go to this. Uh, it's especially important that you make a habit of it, like dedicating a few minutes a day to reviewing pull requests, and if you have reasonably sized pull requests, it shouldn't take much more than that a day for you to review. And also define days of the week to empty the queue. So let's say uh, you're gonna define that every Wednesday, uh, no matter what you, ha what you have to do, you have to clean your pull request reviews queue, because uh, this is probably, this is probably, uh, holding back people from deploying their features this is holding back the whole deployment. Uh, another important thing is to always put clear commit messages. So let's avoid the first one that just says fix PR comments, which is very common, I know, I did that. Uh, and let's try to be a little bit more explicit about what, what we've done. Uh, Let's talk about how we've done things, not about just what we did. So it doesn't take as much time, I don't know, 30 seconds to write a, a simple paragraph, but it helps a lot in the future if you wanna go back in your log and understand when a certain change was made and when you, what, where do you wanna revert to. Another thing is about positive and, and negative feedback. I don't know if you guys have seen this already. This is a, a comment from Linus Torvalds on some guys, some poor guys, PR. For, you can see the, the, the the, the places that I've made a, uh, you know, this is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, so obviously this is a, a pretty negative feedback. Uh, you don't always need to agree with the person, but you don't need to be rude as well. Uh, this is public, you can check it out on the internet later, uh, it's, it's real. Uh, you should always remember that there's a human on the other side of the code review, you're not talking to a machine. So remember that wh whoever's gonna read that thing that you're commenting, that person also might not be in a, in a good day, so try to put yourself in, to, to, how do you say it, to fit their shoes or something like that. Um, also this is between uh, quotation marks because it's an article, it's pretty nice if you wanna read it later. Uh, remember that positive feedback doesn't, al doesn't mean to always agree. Uh, if you give positive feedback, people feel more inclined to expose ideas and it brings the, the idea of failing fast. So the faster you fail, the less resources you, exp you spend uh, pursuing an idea that's not gonna work. Uh, and it perpetuates the, the positive behavior. So if you're positive to someone, some, the, the same person is gonna be positive to you and to whoever, to whoever coach is reviewing. There's also the idea of different roles in pull requests, uh, the code management in the pull request. So as the author or the requester, you should describe the issue. Don't just say like fixing issue one, two, three. Like give a, a brief paragraph of what's the issue because sometimes the issue is described in the card that you're pointing to, but there has been some conversation in the comments and the reviewer is gonna have to look through the, the, all of these comments and understand what was the final, uh, the final decision regarding that issue. So if you just write a paragraph, that saves, saves a lot of time. As a reviewer, remember to always ask questions, do not make demands. So instead of just doing fix that, you, you could say, shouldn't this be like this? Or why is this variable doing nothing versus I don't see this variable being used, maybe it could be removed. Because sometimes you are seeing things you, and you might think that your way of thinking is the correct one, but it gives space for the person who wrote the code to explain to you. And you might even be wrong, you might even not be seeing the way that the person saw it and she might be right. Uh, so remember, you're not a linter to give imperative instructions, nor you're talking to an AI, an AI assistant, so you just, don't just throw orders. You're a human being talking to another one. 
so there's a tip there, uh, as another good practice here is having a minimum of X approvals for a pull request to be merged. So it obviously depends on your team size. Uh, it avoids scenarios like I review yours, you review mine, so people are exchanging favors. Uh, there's a real life example that happened to me. I uh, used to work at a company that we had geo -se geographically separated teams. And what happened, uh, what happened is that the, the guys at the, the other side, uh, like uh, at the other country, they would uh, basically review their own pull requests and merge into our code, and with them we would find lots of bugs because I don't know. I don't know what was their process, but it wasn't pretty. It wasn't very good. Uh, so it not only brings more bugs, but it breaks the team unity. You kind of separate the teams, even though they are the same team, just geographically separated. Also, this is a good practice because it ensures that at least X plus one people know the code. So one people here is the people, the person who wrote the code, and the X is the number of people who's going to review it. So remember, you're reviewing, you're learning about your software, you're learning about your stuff. So whenever, for example, the person who wrote that code is, is out of office for some reason and there's a bug there, there's more people who know that code and might be able to fix it quicker. Atlassian gives a tip about this that you should always assign uh, 1.5 to 2.5 the number of reviews required. So if you require two reviews, you should always re uh, assign I don't know, three or, or five people uh, to that pull request so that people who are busy do not hold the, the review process. Uh, always remember to include screenshots if you're doing UI or UX changes because as the cliche says, a picture is, a, is worth a thousand words. And some changes might not be obvious. Some changes might be too, too specific or the person is not used to seeing that part of your, process or of your software. So uh, a screenshot is always helpful. Also, git blame. Git blame, you usually use it to blame people, right? I mean, who did that crap, crappy code? But uh, git blame is also an, a, a great tool to find out who to assign. So if you do git blame on a file, you'll see which person has made the most changes in that file. And that's probably the person you want to assign to review your code, your changes in that file. Remember to let the automated tools do the needy peak observations. So uh, don't be that person that says, oh, this here should be camel case and it's, uh, it's a snake case. These people, sh this here should be like this. Let the linters do that specifically because if you have uh, well configured linters and, and other tools also mentioned in, in other talks here at PyBay, uh, that will speed up your process. You won't have to worry so much about this, these tiny details and you won't be that annoying person that complains about stuff that nobody cares. Uh, remember to always teach, don't just tell. So I'll show you another example here, uh, a bit further, but uh, don't just say to the person, do this like that. Because uh, if, if you do that, the person will fix the, the, the error or whatever it is, but it's gonna repeat, it's gonna continue doing that because the person doesn't, doesn't know exactly why that was wrong or why that's the correct way of doing. So remember to teach when you're reviewing pull requests. And when some, something breaks, uh, after the code has been deployed to production, for example, remember to share the fault because even though it wasn't you who wrote the code, it passed it through your eyes, you reviewed it, you kind of made sure that it was working. So also the person who wrote the code has, is already under pressure because it was kind of her fault, his fault that uh, the code breaks. So if you share if, if, with, with the person, uh, it's gonna be helpful. Uh, some quick tips here. Uh, for GitHub, you can add uh, keywords for your pull request. For example, if you write in the pull request along with the description, close, uh, hash, 3244, uh, once that pull request is merged, that issue is gonna be closed automatically. So you don't need to remember to clean up the issues later. Uh, you can also on GitHub uh, get permalinks for code snippets so it's easier to reference a specific part of the code when you're commenting. Uh, there are some tools. Uh, Octohint, Refined Bitbucket, and Refined GitHub are browser extensions that help with syntax, syntax highlighting and uh, other neat stuff that help you reviewing pull requests so you don't get just to see the, the code in like plain colors or however your repository shows you. Uh, review apps from Roku and deploy previews from Netlify are very interesting tools. They allow you to create a live instance of your website uh, at, a sp at a public URL with the changes from that pull request. So it's as if the pull request had already been merged to your main code and you can access your, your software online. So it helps the person who is testing it so the person doesn't have to download your, co your new code and run it and have the whole setup on, on his or her computer. Just access the, the URL and uh, it, uh, it will be easier for, for, for the person. Also remember to always use linters. Linters save you a great huge, uh, huge deal of time and it, it uh, makes you avoid uh, 
doing these observations that nobody cares about. So a little bit of our insights at Twinta, some, stu some stuff that we, we, you, we practice over there. Uh, just remember Vinter is where I work, just so it makes sense. Uh, remember to always warn on Slack. So whenever you've created a pull request or you've, you've finished reviewing it or you've finished making the corrections that the somebody uh, requested in the pull request, uh, remember to warn the person. Maybe warn on Slack. Uh, don't rely on simply on repository notifications, email notifications, because those can take a long time. Maybe the person just checks her email once a day or something like that. So uh, warning on Slack is always more, more effective. And remember to, uh, another practice that we do there is to test first the feature and then review the code. So for example, you're testing something in the payment flow and you realize that once you click on, 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 on purchase, uh, it, the, the purchase doesn't happen. So if the flow itself, if the feature itself is not working, it's not worth reviewing the code because the person is gonna have to fix the, fe the feature first and the code is probably gonna change. So you're just gonna waste time if you review the code. So remember to always test first because you will fail fast. You follow this practice of failing fast. You'll fail first and you'll save time. And now for some real world examples. Uh, this is a, these are ex all examples from uh, Django projects, uh, GitHub. Uh, here, uh, this, this person su submitted a pull request with some changes and uh, one of the reviewers said, this pull request is full of merge conflicts. Could you please resolve them first? So uh, first of all, you see how the person was polite in saying that there were some conflicts even though they were, if you look at the, if you look at the GitHub's interface, it's a bit obvious, but uh, it, 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 the person was polite because she, he, he knew that he was talking to another human being. So the, uh, the requester, the, the, the person who created the, the pull request, say that uh, he's, uh, he's not so familiar with the process, he doesn't know quite well what, what conflicts are, and then again, the reviewer took the time to explain things that for somebody who's used to pull requests are pretty obvious, but might not have been for this user, so he took the time to be polite and to, to, to actually teach the person, not just say, this is wrong, do like that. Uh, another thing here, uh, in another pull request, uh, the reviewer asked the guy, uh, are you still struggling with that? So um, if, he, if it wasn't Python 2, it could have been this problem, but since this is Python 3, I don't think that's the issue. Uh, have you tried this and that? So you see that the, the, the reviewer is teaching the person who, who created a pull request. Uh, it's not just saying do like this because this is the correct thing. Another example here, uh, the reviewer asks the person to, to check the guideline files. So that's, uh, you see that people actually use guideline files. Uh, but uh, it also starts describing things that the, per, the, the, the creator of the pull request should start looking in order to fix in the pull request before it can be properly reviewed. And finally, uh, this, this last reviewer uh, suggested that the person should create tests for the features that uh, he or she is uh, submitting for a pull request. And uh, he not only says, okay, there are tests missing, but it, all, it also says, uh, create it in this folder, I think this is the correct place, because the person's probably not used it to that, not fully used it to that library, it doesn't know it, maybe where the tests are located, where, where they should be. And also, a little bit, a little bit further, uh, the reviewer asks, do you mean if name in settings dict? The person could also could have just have said, this is, not, this is not how it should be, but instead, he asked the, 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 the pull request creator if that's what he meant. And actually in, in the answer, the, the creator said that that's not what he meant, that he, he thought of something different. So uh, there was an opportunity for the pull request creator to explain itself and, uh, and, and maybe bring something to the reviewer's attention that he hadn't thought of. And finally, to, to end this presentation, one more thing. Uh, we've created, we are Vinta, we like checklists very much. So we've created a checklist uh, for code review and management that you guys can access. It's completely free, free to use and share in your projects. It's open source so you can contribute with more topics if you think that something is missing there. It's on this link, bit.ly slash pull request checklist. Pretty, uh, yeah. So this is it, thank you very much. Uh, workflow question. W one piece I've always sort of felt was missing is if a reviewer requests changes, then the developer starts making commits on those changes. There's two, three, fourth one comes a few hours later. Is there going to be another one tomorrow? When are they ready for a re review? And so then you fall back to, well, like, just let me know when you're done 
and ready for it, it, this manual communication process is uh, it can fail they forget is there a, a good way to handle that well I'd say it's hard to have a, like an autom an automated solution for that because as you said yourself uh, there's no definition of done in, in the list of commits uh, unfortunately I think uh, it's more like it's, it's, it's more f about creating a better uh, a culture of having the developers being aware that the, the, the more that they, they, they take to, to tell somebody, tell the reviewer that it's done for another round of reviews, uh, the more it's going to be delayed, the, the, the more time it's going to take for the feature to be delivered. And in the end, it's, uh, if you're developing the feature and it kind of uh, has, your, like, uh, it's your name that's on the line there, you should be the one concerned about having the feature de uh, delivered. So it's your responsibility as a developer. You should take responsibility for it. I don't think, I mean, of, of course, there are several things that we can take automated tools to help us. But I think sometimes we should uh, be reminded that we should take responsibility for the things that we were responsible for. In that case, I would say that it's actually the developer's responsibility to be aware to tell uh, as soon as possible when it's ready for review again. And not that I know, there might be a, uh, an a Slack integration or something, but not that I know of. I mean, uh, yeah, just uh, you can comment and mark somebody, but that's, that's as good as you get, I think. It's a really nice talk. Uh, thank you for sharing. A lot of the things like resonated with me because uh, I've faced similar problems. Um, and one thing I wanted to get your advice on was, um, so I've been in a lot of dev teams where eventually there comes a point where a lot of the code reviews get bottlenecked on your uh, technical lead or the senior engineer. While this long-term solution is spread the knowledge across the team, eventually it so happens that all the reviews get bottlenecked on one person. Um, have you experienced that? Do you have any practical tips to sort of how to get around that problem? Um, so, of course, that's going to depend on the on the company's culture. Uh, companies that have a more open culture, open to suggestions, open to uh, you know a more horizontal, as I say, uh, hierarchy, uh, that's going to be easier to do. But for example, uh, in the end, that's the the delay that these these bottlenecks cause. Uh, it's going to impact in the product itself. So maybe if that's something that's not uh, possible to talk directly with the, with the people uh, they are causing the bottleneck, so they can try to figure out or speed up, or maybe, as you said, distribute the, 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 know, the knowledge. Uh, maybe that's something that could be brought up even higher, up higher, so to somebody even higher than that. So, so the person knows this is causing bottlenecks in the product, this is causing us to deliver you know, less fast, so, so uh, stuff like that. And also uh, that, uh, if possible, that Atlassian tip of assigning more people than actually required for, uh, for merging the pull request could speed up a bit of the process, I think. That's a good point about the bottlenecks. I would, th um, if somebody is reluctant to delegate things or doesn't trust people, that might cause that to happen. Just, just a thought. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I think also the, the, the practice of maybe if you're, like, if you're uh, aware of this problem and you're willing to fix it, willing to, to make it, to improve it, uh, having that mentality of having like a day of the week to empty the queue of pull requests to be reviewed, that could also help with uh, avoiding bottlenecks. Uh, I'll just say real quick that a solution for the bottleneck thing is like if you lar have a large team with just a tech lead, you need to divide your team. Like uh, it happened with a company we worked with, uh, they had like one lead developer and then they decided like to promote other developer to, to have like four lead developers and actually they divided the team into four because the, the project was so huge that it, the, the project was actually four projects into one. So the, the trick was to divide the project into multiple products in just one. So they, they had a sync uh, with those four uh, lead developers weekly, but those four lead developers would review the code of their, uh, their own project. So I guess it's a tip, another tip is like to dividing the project. Yeah, there you go. 
Cool. Any more? Oh. So then maybe uh, one lesson is that rather than say the problem is this particular person, maybe it's the organization as a whole that needs to uh, yeah. be tweaked. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there Yeah, a question about the the point you made about um, don't just rely on email notifications, but go and warn. Um, I'm interested in how that scales as your team grows and maybe your team puts out a lot of code reviews. Are you worried about constant pings of team members to other team members? Hey, do my code review or pull request? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the last part of your question, but I'll try to answer it. If, if I didn't answer it completely, you can just say it again. It's okay. Um, so scaling it, uh, might be, as he said, uh, might, you might actually need to divide your team if it's too big or um, if it's too big that the, the reviewers are not able to handle the, the review load. Uh, re scaling regarding, I don't know, notifications maybe, I don't know if that's something you've mentioned about uh, like disturbing the person uh, who is receiving the notifications. I think that uh, it's something that you should should weigh the pros and cons in your company. Like, uh, is is uh, am I gonna put my Slack on mute, for example, for a while because I need to really focus on this? I don't want to be disturbed. But then I'm gonna go back and check. If you're gonna take like uh, two uh, two hours break and just focus on your on your coding on your whatever task you're doing, you don't want to be bothered. Uh, it's not gonna be a problem. The, the pull request is not gonna be. It's probably not gonna be uh, a problem if it gets delayed for two hours. Uh, if you if you adopt a policy like that so you, you, you know that you're going to get a lot of notifications. Uh, you might uh, adopt something like that, but be aware that you should check every now and then to see what's new. Uh, so you kind of balance, try to balance that, those things. I don't know if that answers your question. Questions? OK, so I guess that's it. Uh, could we give Luca another round of applause? Thank you.